Oh wow, I didn't know I was a playable character in this game. Hello everyone and welcome. Today we're beating Sekiro Shadows Die Twice while completely basic. So you might be thinking, Doom, this isn't some crazy unique or particularly difficult challenge. Plenty of people have done a base vitality run. And that's true. The reason I'm doing it now is that I have other runs I want to do that are more difficult and it's been a hot minute since I played Sekiro, so I wanted a nice easy challenge to get back into it. If only I knew how much I was lying to myself by thinking this would be easy. Also, I plan on doing Soul Level 1 for every Soulsborne game, so I might as well check it off the list. <laughs> well, game's over everyone, the Dragon Heritage ends here. Okay, my first real decision of what to do in this run, do I give the charm to Kudo or keep it for myself? To give it away is to make the game harder, so naturally that is exactly what I do. I would soon find out, however, that this was a mistake. The debuff icon for Charmless is the kanji for difficult? Yeah, that tracks. For those of you that don't know, giving the charm to Kudo will cause the following debuffs to be applied. Chip damage will be taken unless you perfectly deflect. Enemies have more health and posture. Wolf will take more health and posture damage, and status effects will build up faster. On the upside, I do get more experience in Sin, so that's cool. Anyway, making my way through the tutorial area, I eventually get to the first real boss of the run, Genichiro Ashina. For not having played this game in like three years, I was doing okay in this fight. Right up until I forgot I don't have Makita counter and kind of just rammed my face onto his sword, but it's okay, old Genichiro here will give us a helping hand up. That is the opposite of what I said, but that's okay. Fun fact about me that you probably didn't know, I can speak Japanese. Second fun fact that you could probably guess, I'm not very good at it, but the reason I mention that is because you're going to hear me say the names of characters or places with Japanese pronunciation, so if you're wondering why I sound like a weeb, it's because I am one. I already know, like, half my comments now are going to be Omae wa mo shindeiru, and you know what? I'm okay with this. Oh, a prayer bead. Well, that's completely useless to me, but I'll take the gourd seed, though. Thank you, Mr. General Man. The Mr. General Man? Nah, yeah, he's probably fine. I lie to this old lady, so she gives me the Young Lord's Bell Charm, then I use it to travel to the past where I can fight Aku, the shape-shifting master of darkness. Oh, wait, wrong franchise. Hirata Estate is a whole side area that I'll need to do eventually, but for now, I only came to get the flame barrel for an arm I didn't know I would have in three years. Whatever, back in the present day, I meet up with this fine man who looks a little cold, so being the kind-hearted shinobi that I am, I set him on fire. This sign can't stop me because I can't read. This sign can't stop me because the internet won't let it. By ringing this bell, I become haunted by the bell demon, which I have personal experience with after eating Taco Bell at 3am. So what does the bell demon do? Well, remember all that stuff I said about the charmless debuff? Yeah, it's that, except they stack. I figured if I'm going to be in one-shot range for everything, I might as well double down. To be fair, the wiki does say if you don't have the charm, the effects of the bell demon are lessened, but uh, yeah, you could have fooled me. Here we see the species Humongous Snake is stalking its prey. Because of its monstrous size, this animal has no fear of any retaliation, but as it will soon learn to back wolf into a corner, well, the hunter shall become the hunted. I make a quick pit stop to buy the firecrackers and it's off to fight... Uh, who are you again? Oh, that's right, how could I forget? You only scream it at me every time I enter the arena. You know, there's definitely a Melania Blade of Mikula joke in there somewhere, but I'm too stupid to make it. Mr. Oniwa here isn't terribly hard. Honestly, the camera puts up more of a fight than he does, but that's the theme of every FromSoft game. Unfortunately, since I'm out of practice, he does introduce me to the business end of his spear, and now the sculptor is dying, so that's cool. Emma, what can you tell me about the Dragon Rot? Well, that's not very nice. I remember when Dragon Rot was first announced, and I thought it was a horrible idea. I mean, a mechanic that punishes you for dying in a FromSoft game? That sounds awful, but really, the Dragon Rot kind of doesn't do anything? All it does is lower your chance for unseen aid and make it to where you can't progress the affected NPC's quest lines, but like, does that matter? I can only think of one NPC's quest line that would make a difference, and that's for the merchant that can expand the store if you do it, but that's pretty much it. Everyone else is just for world building. Anyway, back to Gyobu. It took me a little while to get back into the swing of things, but when I do, he goes down easy. Now I have the only remaining choice for this whole challenge run. Do I level attack power? To me, attack power is the same as leveling weapons in Dark Souls. It doesn't violate the Soul Level 1 rule, and fighting in-game bosses with zero attack power just sounds... tedious, so I decided to allow it. Immediately following that great boss is this horrible one. No joke, my notes for this section just reads, Get bodied by the blazing bull. I had initially planned to do Hirata Estate much later, but the bull here was such a hard wall, I decided to do it now. Back in the past, I buy the Withered Red Gourd hoping it'll help with any burn status, then meet up with dear old dad who would never ever do anything to hurt me. He gives me the key and tells me to go find our lost child, and it's off to the top of the estate where I take on Juzo the Drunkard. So the resident alcoholic here is surrounded by a bunch of other enemies, uh, shield guys, bow guys, swords guys, and I don't really understand why. 
Okay, it's to make it harder, but like, why FromSoft? Why did you make a game with such an incredible combat loop, then ruin it by having some fights with groups of enemies? This game shines when it's a one-on-one -on -one duel to the death, but here I am fighting like seven guys at once. There is a blue shirt man nearby that'll help us if we politely ask, and I think he's intended to keep the enemies distracted while you thin them out, but honestly, it's easier to kite them around and pick them off than ask for help with the boss. So I didn't actually mean to have Juzo drop aggro here, but hey, I'll take it, making this fight much, much easier. Well, rip a blue shirt guy, but hopefully in his dying breath he saw us win. Couldn't do it without him. No idea what his name is. Next up is Lady Butterfly, and she... Yes, game, I know about Vitality and Posture. Wow, that is a really late tooltip to show up. Whatever, the hardest part about this fight is that because of her relatively small size and the fact that she uses her feet, it can sometimes be hard to tell what she's doing. That is, until you realize that anytime she perfectly parries, if she retaliates with a kick, you can just loop her. If she jumps away, then you have plenty of time to tell what she's doing. Phase 2, she adds some unblockable butterfly kunai attacks, which are kind of annoying, but she also has this ability to summon a bunch of adds. You're meant to use a snap seed to dispel them, but what if you just don't let her summon them? The fight is much, much easier when you just bully her into a corner and she can't back off and actually do the ability. Eventually, she goes down. I make a quick stop to get the Mist Raven feathers, and now there's nowhere left to run. It's time for the Blazing Bull. I hate this fight. Like, really, it is the worst fight by far in the whole game. The whole time the game has been teaching the player in order to win fights, you have to either lower the boss's vitality or break their posture, both of which can be done through constant pressure and deflecting attacks. So tell me why does this boss not only have obscene posture regeneration, but also hyper armor on attacks, as well as causing you to take chip damage on perfect deflex because of the fire horns? It doesn't make sense. You could make a case that the hyper armor is because he's an angry rampaging bull, and okay, fair, I'll give you that, but taking damage and status buildup on perfect deflex is kind of... Well, bull. I know it wouldn't make sense to have it only happen on blocks or imperfect parries because it's the same sword, but you can't punish the player for perfectly deflecting attacks, which is the core of the combat loop. It just doesn't work. The other way to fight him, that basically everyone does, is to simply run around until the boss does this little drag swivel turn thing, get one or two hits in, then repeat. The problem there is that not only does the boss take reduced damage to his body, but what's the point of teaching this to the player when literally every other fight is meant to be taken head on? Don't get me wrong, using Wolf's superior speed is helpful in many boss fights, but I can't think of one that the whole thing boils down to run away until I can get one attack, then repeat. To make it worse, because of the increased enemy health, the bull no longer one-shots the adds in the fight, so I either have to kite the boss attacks into them or deal with them myself. And that last point isn't the fault of the game's design, it's something I did to myself, so I can't say it's unfair, but god is it annoying. What I need to do is come up with a strategy. Maybe I recruit some of the friendly locals to help, or if that doesn't work, maybe I can ask one of them to jump on his back and ride him towards the enemy tower. Oh, sorry, I'm not talking about Sekudo. I'm talking about today's sponsor, Clash Royale. Clash Royale is a real-time multiplayer game starring the Royales, your favorite Clash characters, and so much more. But in this game with so many characters, we all know who the single most important is. No, it's not the king or the princesses, or even the baby dragon, if you can believe that. It's the Hog Rider. Yes, go my Hog Rider, so majestic and fearsome, yet cool and collected. On the battlefield, he is truly a sight to behold. He will stop at nothing, and I mean nothing, to tear down the enemy fortress, and oh, he's dead. Not to fear, I have plenty of other champions and minions to fill the now canyon-sized hole in my heart. My dear Hog Rider, you will be me- eh, he's back! But really though, I have been having so much fun playing Clash Royale. It might be the collector in me, because there are dozens of cards that can be gathered and upgraded, including the aforementioned best one ever, Hog Rider, but so many more. There are spell cards you can sling at your opponent to rain damage from afar, or towers that will defend your kingdom from invaders, all with their own strengths and weaknesses. Or perhaps I like it because of all of the possible build varieties between charging the enemy or building more towers to interrupt your opponent's plans. Or maybe it's both. Yeah, both is good. Build decks to your heart's contents. Will you settle on a defensive playstyle or maybe an aggressive one that rushes down the enemy king? Personally, I prefer to be a little tricky, bait my opponent in defending one side and then sending my troops to dominate their undefended tower. Ignore the fact that they've already taken one of mine, it's all part of the plan, I swear. A battle well fought, my valiant opponent, but in the end, I stand victorious. Never mind that it's a tiebreaker or the fact that I lost our first four matches. Wait, are we still recording? Uh, no, edit that out. Battle along the trophy road for glory and to find powerful rare cards to add to your collection. But it's mostly for the glory. Use my link in the description below to download Clash Royale right now for free. Or you can use my QR code on the screen. Really, they've made it so easy to play. I look forward to facing all of you on the battlefield and a big thanks to Clash Royale for sponsoring this video. Now if only I could bring the Royales to support me with the Blazing Bull. It took 
far longer than it should have, but with him down, I can finally progress. Fortunately, at this point, the game opens up a bit. There are four different main paths that we can take, but only two of them are completable right now. Still, some non-linearity is nice. Elden Ring really spoiled me with the whole, this boss is too hard, I'll go try something else. Back in my day, if you were slamming your head into a brick wall, the only options were to keep slamming or give up, and mama didn't raise no quitter. I climb to the top of the tower to meet objectively the best enemy in any game ever, then infiltrate the castle. Oh no. I believe this is intended to be the path a normal player should follow, but really I'm only here for Sabimaru. After grabbing it, I make my way towards the reservoir. See this green thing meant to indicate where I can grapple? Yeah, it's more of a suggestion, really. Shikibu Toshikatsu Yamauchi, my mortal enemy. I don't know why, but this man gives me more problems than most bosses do, and after dying to him a handful of times, I began to wonder why I was even fighting him. The prayer bead he gives is actually worthless, but at this point, it isn't about the items. It's about sending a message. Excuse me, ma'am, uh, what's at the bottom of this giant hole in the ground? Time for Snake Eyes. I used to hate this fight, but then I was told you can actually parry the grab, and that makes it much easier. As long as you don't miss. The game never once tells you this, by the way, and it makes me wonder what other attacks have a weird interaction that are exceptions to the rule. In Mibu Village, I meet up with Odin of the Water, and if anyone is wondering if I've been having fun on this run... No, the answer is no. Even though she's a mini-boss, I still wanted to fight her because she's unique to this one area and has fun attacks to parry. Plus, Sabimaru absolutely melts her posture. Now it's time for my second brick wall of the run, Corrupted Monk. This boss has the highest posture recovery of any enemy in the game. It's ridiculous and it means I have to do vitality damage to even have a chance at winning. The game wants you to either use Divine Confetti for the guaranteed vitality damage through blocks or use Snap Seeds to deal heavy damage, but my problem with that is I don't like using limited quality items like the Confetti. For Snap Seeds, I didn't actually know that they caused damage and thought they only stunned the boss, so that's my mistake, but I stand by not wanting to use items I can't readily get an unlimited amount of. I spend well over an hour just throwing myself at this boss, which in hindsight doesn't sound like a lot, but I'm sure whatever number of deaths I'm putting on the screen now would indicate I'm good at this game, I swear. As annoying as this fight was for me, I will say Corrupted Monk has one of the most fun movesets to parry, and eventually she goes down and I gain the ability to breathe underwater. You know, that totally normal skill all shinobi have. Oh god, the voices are back. Yeah, against my better judgment. Sinpo Temple. I love this area, it's just so pretty. I mean, the whole game is gorgeous, honestly, but Simpo Temple and another late game area are just stunning. Then again, I'm probably biased. Ah, Mr. Armored Warrior. I like to think this fight is From's way of pitting a strength main against a dex main because we all know who the most powerful is in the end. That's right, gravity. Unfortunately, that's basically the end of this level as we can't do the main boss without progressing through Ashina Castle, but I do grab the Simpo Esoteric Text and Holy Chapter Infested. The former I didn't know if I'd need, and the latter's for the good ending. Next, I head through the sunken valley towards the gun fort. At first, I was worried about this. I never picked up the umbrella, and their guns can do a lot of damage, but it ended up being pretty easy to get through, which is more than I can say for the centipede. Now, this boss isn't supposed to be hard. You just parry his full combo four times, and that's it. He's done. But this fight is what really made me feel the base posture that I had. Perfectly deflecting attacks will build your posture meter, but will never break it. Imperfect parries, however, will. What that means is that even if I perfect parry the first 8 hits of his combo, if the ninth hit isn't perfect, it'll break my stance, leaving me wide open to an attack, which usually results in death. Oh, and you know I'm taking chip damage for every mistake I make, so that's cool. Of course this won't be a problem at all later, it's not like one of the bosses in this game is notorious for being aggressive or anything. Eventually he goes down, but that's the end of this road without a key that is, you guessed it, at the top of Ashina Castle, so I head that way to fight an old friend, but first I get dumpstered by this random Ashina elite like half a dozen times. At first I thought this was just some cool anime fight, but now I realize he's teaching us how to counter Ashina Cross, which is cool, but I have a different strategy for that ability when the time comes. Genichiro is actually pretty easy once you realize the player sets the pacing. There's hardly anything to this fight, just swing in sets of twos and react to whatever he does after he deflects. Phase 2 looks super cool, but it's even easier because he adds a hilariously telegraphed thrust and lightning, just uh, make sure you time the jump right. After his defeat, he runs away like the little baby he is, but don't worry, he'll be back. He always comes back. Mr. Ishin, I've heard you were a master swordsman in your day, but you don't look so strong to me. I bet I could beat you in a duel. <laughs> ha! Kudo hands me the gun for key, but I completely ignore it and instead head back to Simpo Temple because now I can fight the folding screen monkeys. 
I am pretty sure I have not once in my life ever fought this boss the way you're intended to. You're supposed to lure each monkey into the area designed to counter its role, but in the past I kinda just run them down? Once you know the path they're gonna take, it's not so hard. Prior to starting this run though, I watched a speedrun of this game where the runner used Gachin's sugar and completely trivialized the fight. I mean, it's not like it's a hard fight, it's just a puzzle, but that item made it to where none of the monkeys could see and the whole thing took like 30 seconds, it's ridiculous. The battle memory of an extraordinary foe, you know, whatever you say, game. Hello, small child, I hear you have a legendary sword in your possession. I require it, no need to read me the warning label. Uh, why didn't I listen to the warning? With Mortal Blade in hand, I do a bit of running around to set up the ending, which basically means eating some crunchy rice, delivering a persimmon, being told that you're not supposed to eat rice raw, then grab an old book for the Divine Child to have some quality reading material. That's all I can do for now, so it's off to the sunken valley. What do you think those monkeys are thinking about? Wear a banana. Wear a banana. Wear a banana. Wear a banana. Guardian Ape was one of the fights I was kinda worried about, but the same speedrunner I was watching taught me that Midair Mortal Draw has the same damage as Empowered Mortal Draw. To be honest, I don't know if that was ever patched out or not, but it's fine, it means I can leap at the- Oh crap, I don't have Midair Combat Arts. A small amount of farming later, I come back with Midair Combat Arts and... Oh yeah, that's pretty juicy. I could hit even harder if I used Yashariku Sugar, but I was still in the part of the game where not everything bosses do one-shot me, and I wanted to ride that joy a little longer. After just a few attempts, the big monkey goes down. I don't know what I was worried about. I mean, he only has one life bar. It's not like he's gonna get back up or nothing. Okay, obviously it's a pretty well-known thing now, but you gotta admit, it was a pretty cool fake out when the game first launched. Anyway, Headless Ape is much easier because the sword makes it pretty clear what attacks he's going for, and before long, the monkey is no more. Well, I guess that's also a lie, but I'll get to that later. First, I politely asked this man to fly a kite for me, then I gazed down upon the Great Serpent. Also, the snake from earlier. I kind of feel bad because I actually like snakes. Uh, then again, he did try to kill me. I can never remember where this stupid monkey is, but that doesn't matter. In that speed run, oh yeah, I'm not a speedrunner. Fighting these guys more than one at a time is such a pain. I sure hope I don't ever have to do that. That guy definitely looks like he'd be prime backstab material, but I have something the game doesn't know about. Knowledge from past runs. It didn't matter. Again, I don't really understand the idea of having cool enemies to fight in a duel, then ruining it by making it a 2v1, but whatever, I'm okay with Uno reversing this encounter. Next, I have a stoic reunion with my dear old dad that I thought definitely died three years ago, and he tells me to betray the only other person I've ever cared about, and like a good little shinobi, I listen. Hey baby, why don't we put the swords down and- ah! Well, that'll teach me to never disrespect a woman. So I have done the Shuda ending exactly twice before, both only to get 100% completion. Translation, I have no idea how to fight Emma or Ishin and get dumpstered for two hours straight. Emma actually has relatively low vitality and posture, her timings can feel a bit floaty and weird, but once you learn the four hit combo, she's pretty easy. Ishin suffers from the same loop issue that Genichiro does, where you can basically hit him twice, deflect, and then react to whatever he does. Just don't attack him twice in neutral, learn that the hard way. The only real problem is that to even try Ishin, you have to get past Emma, and to try Ishin's second phase, you have to get through the first. Sure, by constantly losing, you slowly gain the information necessary to succeed, but that doesn't change the fact that it's annoying to just barely get by Phase 1 Ishin, only to immediately die to Phase 2. And yes, you can bet that I'm going to complain about that again later. Whatever, after way too many tries, he goes down. We did it, Kudo! We saved Japan! With the power of time travel and save scumming, Owl is alive again. This time, we reject his stupid offer, which means we have to fight him. Having done this fight and the harder version later several times before, I thought it would be an easy win, but nope, I get bodied by Owl for two hours straight as well, so that's cool. I very rarely ever say these games are unfair, but I do want to point out one rather unfortunate interaction I found in this fight. So normally, if you get your posture broken or end up on the ground, Owl will try to step on you for a finishing move, but you have plenty of time to roll out of the way. If, however, you get your posture broken while trading with him, you'll actually stagger him and he can instantly do the stomp. So basically, any time I traded with him was just instant death. You could make the case to just not play that aggressive and it wouldn't happen, and you're not wrong, but that definitely feels like an unintended animation quirk. Whatever, it's fine. Eventually, I get good and he goes down. Before continuing, I do a little running around to get the Father's Bell Charm, which will be necessary to complete all bosses. Then, the Divine Child gives me the Frozen Tears for the ending, and it's back to Mibu Village to get picked up by a massive man made of straw. You think people in neighboring villages can see this and just think, ah, them crazy city folk are at it again. Time to return to Monk, which I think is easier than the corrupted version, despite having three health bars, mostly because she doesn't have 12 Infinity Posture Regen, making pairing attacks actually worth a damn. 
Still hits like a dump truck, though. I know less than, like, a minute ago, I said I rarely ever say these games are unfair, but I'm about to do it again. Whoa, wait, wait, hear me out before you dislike and say I need to get good. The game has taught us that to avoid sweeps, you either need to be far enough away that the boss whiffed the attack, or simply jump over them. And Corrupted Monk here has sweep attacks that absolutely can be jumped over. So far, so good. In Phase 3, she gains a perilous attack where she shoots centipedes at you that cause terror buildup. It's a pretty easy attack to just sidestep when you see it coming. However, she will occasionally do the sweep and immediately follow it up with this terror attack, and it's unavoidable if you stomped on her head. Since terror is just a one-shot if the bar fills up, this is actually just bullshit. There was one instance where the full terror buildup didn't happen, but that was honestly just because I maxed out my hidden luck stat. The only proper defense I could find was to jump away from the monk on the off chance he decides to do that combo, but that really feels like an unfair interaction for the player. Don't worry, from here on out there are no other BS things, and if I died it's because I sucked and not because the game made me. But if the monk wants to cheese us, I'll cheese her right back, and I don't feel bad for this at all. I hate this game. Never mind, I love this game. With her down, I can get to my actual favorite area of the game, Fountainhead Palace. This place is just gorgeous. The massive Sakura tree, the deep lake, the destroyed temple that sits on top of it, just 10 out of 10 would live here. Huh, didn't know this game was actually a middle school dodgeball simulator. Time to fight the Divine Dragon, definitely the coolest looking gimmick boss, but there's nothing special here. Alright, I am now the only person to have ever died to this boss. Awesome, thanks game. So wait, if this is the same Divine Dragon that is causing the Dragage Heritage problem, what if we just kill it? Like, would that stop everything, or am I just rolling too much evil here? Well, whatever, I have the Divine Tears either way. It seems in my absence, Ashina Castle was overrun. You leave for five minutes and the whole town goes to the dumpster, I swear. Since we're in the end game, I figured I might as well finally get real dad out of the way, so I use his bell to see his... memory... Yeah, this is where the past thing falls apart. With the first one, it's my memory, so it sort of makes sense that I'm just vividly remembering it, but I don't know how this one works. Yeah, anyway, first up is definitely not this lone shadow because I don't have to fight him, so I won't. See ya, buddy. Unfortunately, the ability to run past enemies is short-lived as there's a mandatory mini-boss, Juzo, who is standing with a lone shadow and various ads around. Why this game insists on putting difficult enemies together is beyond me, but I have a little trick to turn the tide in my favor. Candy. Gachin's Sugar, to be exact. It's a little finicky, but it's possible to pop one of these then run straight up to the lone shadow and friend no jutsu him onto my team. Even if he does nothing to the boss, it still takes him out of the fight, and after literally running circles around Juzo, I can press on to the main attraction. Fortunately, with all my practice from earlier, this version of Owl isn't a big deal. Despite having some differences, Phase 1 feels more like a combination of his two phases for Great Shinobi Owl. Phase 2 Owl does get the cool Fire Owl attacks, but it's like his greatest strength is his greatest weakness, because you just jump over it then stomp his blade. I did have a weird end to this where it looks like deflecting his shuriken posture broke him. When watching back the footage, at no other point did deflecting them cause him posture damage, but here it did and I guess I'll take it? Back in present day, I want to deposit my coin into a person. This merchant has infinite divine confetti? Since when? Apparently, this happens after you beat True Monk and get the dragon's tally board. I feel like I should just buy a warehouse full of this stuff, but whatever, that's good to know for future reference. So I didn't originally plan on fighting Headless Ape, but it's a memory and he blocks an item I want, so here we are. Fortunately, Mortal Draw decimates him and can even be used to stagger both of the apes in Phase 2. Fun fact, part of the reason I do Mibu Village early is because if you do it before the regular Guardian Ape, you can just skip this fight if you want. You know, if anybody wants pro tips for a game that's almost 4 years old. Either way, with him gone, the arena is now home to the Shichimen Warrior, but I'm armed with enough Divine Confetti to cover a whole parade and the Lilac Umbrella as backup, so he's just in the way. Ah, I see it was I who was just in the way. This warrior drops the Malcontents Ring, something that I'll make use of soon, and by soon, I mean right now because it's time for the Demon of Hatred. Oh hey, thanks for the experience, Mr. Hatred. So this fight is one that I was dreading ever since I decided to play this game again. I just never learned how to fight him. Half of his attacks do the fire chip damage even on perfect deflects, and I'll just die if anything hits me normally. Couple that with him having a large health pool and three health bars? It's not a good time. My first strategy was to use Wolf's crazy mobility and just bait attacks, and it was working, albeit very slowly. I mean like, 10 minutes a health bar slow. And of course, one mistake and it's just 20 minutes wasted, but more importantly, I knew this wasn't how you were supposed to fight him, it just didn't feel right. 
The Blazing Bull is the only other encounter that has you running around trying to do chip vitality damage and we all know how I feel about that fight. I could have done the exploit and walked him off a cliff, but I didn't want to do that either because it felt like it would take away from the challenge, so I did the only other option I could. I used the internet to look up a guide on how to fight him. I know, crazy right? Anyway, I found that the ultimate strategy for fighting him was to just hug him and circle counterclockwise. Wait, that can't be right. You're telling me that my most hated boss in this whole game pulls a Zoolander and can't look left? There's no way. But in fact, it was the way. I won't show the whole fight because it still takes like 5 minutes, but literally the whole strategy is to just stay as close to him as you can. The only problem is when he sprints away and he can hit you with a fireball sling, but that can be avoided by running away and baiting the non-fireball variant then charging back in. It isn't necessary, but pairing with the lilac umbrella for projected force helps a little too, and if you use the fire umbrella, you'll completely negate any fire damage. Save malcontent for phase 3 and the fight's pretty much free. I'll admit, I don't know how to feel about this. On the one hand, I feel so happy that one of my least favorite fights in all of FromSoft is now much more manageable and actually something I look forward to. On the other hand, should a late game boss really be beaten just by moving to the right? I guess the actual final boss more than makes up for that though, so it's okay. Speaking of, it's time to cry. I mean die. I mean hey Genichiro, how's it going? So real quick, I want to say this Genichiro fight is just annoying. Not because he's hard, but just he's in the way. Anyone that has played this game knows the frustration of trying to learn the final boss's moveset only to die and then have to fight this loser all over again. That being said, he does get an honorable mention for being a slight thorn in my side as pretty much anything he does can kill me and that feels bad. But with him out of the way, it's time for Ishin the Sword Saint. Hands down, the best fight in this whole game, and definitely up there is one of the toughest fights From has ever designed. That being said, there is nothing this man can do that the game hasn't prepared you for. I spent 7 hours fighting him, and the run back isn't very long. I don't know how many attempts it was, I'll put that on the screen in a minute, but it got my sodium levels high enough to make a salt mine blush, but even then, I never felt like I couldn't win. Every death, I felt like I was getting that much closer to victory. I was honestly prepared to write a rant over some of the things in this fight, like how he gains some super armor on a couple attacks during the spear phase, or that he can fire a matchlock pistol like a semi-automatic, but honestly, all of those problems kind of melted away after a while, and all that was left was the clanging of our swords. It feels like a duel against a master swordsman. It's hard to explain, but compared to someone like Owl or Genichiro, Ishin is just in a class of his own, leagues above them, and above Wolf, and by extension, the player. A pretty agreed upon theme of FromSoft games is that they're designed to make you overcome the insurmountable, to give you a task that just looks so colossal and impossible that you think, how can I ever do that? And then you do it, and no fight encapsulates that better than Ishin the Sword Saint, and I love him for it. If you haven't played this game before, I can't recommend it enough, it's one of my all time favorites. I can't however recommend this challenge though, as Ishin is the only fight that I actually felt like I overcame a challenge, everything else was just hollow victories. Either way, with a final blow, he goes down and we have saved Japan. Wait, that wasn't our goal? Thank you everyone for watching, if you made it this far, please consider giving a like and subscribing, it helps the channel out way more than you know, and a big, big thanks to my amazing patrons, stay beautiful y'all. Until next time my friends. Don't you dare go hollow.